Well, welcome to our first ever virtual Earth Day event hosted by Young Professionals at Washington Policy Center. My name is Miranda Hawkins. I'm the Young Professionals Director. And for those of you who haven't heard of our YP group, we are a diverse community of young professionals aimed to educate and empower anyone 18 to 40 years of age on important issues affecting our state. We believe in policies that enrich lives by giving everyday people unobstructed opportunities to innovate what needs to be fixed. To this end, we embrace free market solutions, civil debate, and a policy plus action mindset where, as I like to say, we walk it like we talk it. We're actively seeking ways to make Washington State a better place to live. And that's why we're here tonight. Hundreds of people are joining us from across the state and even across the country from Ohio, Colorado, um, Oregon, Utah, and we're learning how science and technology are creating meaningful solutions to our toughest environmental problems. Tonight, we're going to learn how to harness technology and individual choice to accomplish what political protest and bureaucracy cannot. We'll be featuring three speakers, Sean Frankson with Plastic Bank to discuss cleaning up ocean plastic, Todd Myers, Director of the Center for the Environment at Washington Policy Center, who will discuss smartphone environmentalism, and Benji Backer, founder and president of American Conservation Coalition, to give, us, to give us an alternative to AOC's Green New Deal. At the end, we will have a Q&A session. You can submit your questions using the chat feature on your control panel or by emailing Rosemary Harris, which is R Harris, H-A-R-R-I-S at WashingtonPolicy.org. And that email will also be in the chat box in your control panel. To conclude the event, we'll have Chris Cargill, our Eastern Washington director, join us for a few minutes with some exciting news. So thank you for joining us tonight. For, um, to thank you for joining, we're gonna enter everyone tonight into a raffle to win a one-year subscription to Plastic Bank's Hero Award, which I will announce at the end. So to kick us off, I'd like to introduce Sean Frankson. Um, Sean is a co-founder and CTO for Plastic Bank. He um, is making plastic waste a currency to fight ocean plastic by using blockchain to provide an ethical, transparent, and scalable supply chain of social plastic that helps lift people out of poverty. Sean's ability to strategize has taken him all over the world. He was named an Ashoka Emerging Innovator, an IBM Champion, received the Sustainia Community Award, and the United Nations Momentum for Change Award. Sean, take it away. Perfect. Thanks for having me. Ocean plastic is something that we've been focused on for a long time. I mean, it's ironic. We call it a plastic problem. But really, it's a human problem. A problem that we can solve if we all unite together. And it's amazing this world we've seen with COVID. This world we've seen with COVID has really revealed that the world can unite together when the right reason gets behind it. And I truly believe ocean plastic is something that we can all play a part in. And when it comes to the part that we play, we look at this childhood metaphor that if you walked into the kitchen and the sink is overflowing with water pouring on the floor and all you have is a bucket, a plunger and a mop, what do you do first? The answer is simply, you turn off the tap. So when we started to look at the root cause of ocean plastic, and we started to get creative on how could we turn off the tap, we started by looking where ocean plastic was coming from in the first place. We uncovered that 80% of ocean plastic actually comes from the land, mostly in developing countries where there's no waste management systems. And people just throw the plastic into the environment 
quite often because most of the people are really just trying to survive to the day. And it's tough to think about the world, about the ocean we are trying to survive for the day. So when they throw the plastic, it has to go somewhere. And all too often, somewhere always leads back to the ocean. This is an image I took in Peru, where as soon as it rains, the plastic will flow into the river. This is Paseco, Philippines. And Southeast Asia is one of the largest contributor to ocean plastic in the world. And this is Haiti. All too often, these scenes exist, not just in the extreme, but in the abundance of where some of the most vulnerable people live. And the irony is that plastic has value. You know, if plastic was worth a dollar, you wouldn't see a bottle of plastic anywhere on the ground in any country. And we uncovered that it doesn't need to be worth a dollar. We just need to add that little bit more that reveals the value in plastic, makes it too valuable to enter the ocean and really reveal value in the people that are all part of this solution. So when we looked at what we need to do to create the plastic bank, how not just to be a marketing campaign, a nice to have thing, how to truly turn off the tap, we uncovered that our starting point was to figure out how might we gather together one billion people to regenerate the planet? How might we always be inclusive of the most vulnerable people on this planet? And how might we work in imperfect ecosystems where we can design to thrive in some of the hardest conditions on this planet to do business? For us, it all starts with our collection communities. People like Lise Nassim in Haiti. After the 2010 earthquake, Lisa became a widow with no job, seven kids, illiterate, no bank account. Now, Lisa's a member of the plastic bank. She brings her plastic to the local plastic bank. It's sorted by weight, by color, and a value is deposited into Lisa's digital account, which she can safely save or redeem for the items she need. And even our onboarding process of how do we work in these communities, we uncovered that our programs need to do more than train people to recycle. In Haiti, we train people to become literate. We train job skills, and we train for a life beyond recycling where recycling is just a starting point to a universal basic income that people can earn with dignity. And it's a little different in every country and we localize and familiarize to make it a community program. In the Philippines, people are given carts, localized uniforms so they can be proud and act with dignity as local champions in the community. We have some people work alone, others work in cooperatives where groups can be supportive together and have a cooperative model of recycling, earning livelihoods and stability. And we even have ways to include the community. In places like Bali, Indonesia, anyone can bring their plastic to a local plastic bank on their way to the market, on the way back from a store, and really just play their part in cleaning the community. And what we found is when we include a community, Everyone sees the person recycling as someone with value because they also have that same paradigm that recycling is the way to treat plastic responsibly. And behind all of this is a blockchain application. And it works differently for every type of participant that we have. For our members, they get a digital ID, a trust score, a digital credit score, a digital savings account, and most people, for the first time, this is their first phone, their first bank account, their first ability to save and have that control. And it even grants that access to find clearly where they can get the most value for their plastic and really be part of this gamified life improvement program that is really just meant to unite the world in this change. And the heart of our business model is really these plastic bank branches where in some countries like Haiti, we'll create a plastic bank branch from scratch, we'll create the recycling communities. But in others where it already exists, we don't go in and compete, we don't disrupt the economy. Instead, we empower the existing infrastructure to become certified plastic bank locations where everyone proudly follows our code of conduct, our ethical recycling programs, you know, our rules and regulations so that everyone can qualify for a special bonus program where they can give their registered members a special bonus payment on top of the market price of plastic 
and in doing so for following the rules the code of conduct for being part of now an ethically continuously improving program these branches also make more in a special bonus so that everyone's incentivized just to be part of this solution and again it's all backed by a blockchain technology where it becomes a business in your pocket where someone gets their own trust score to qualify and stay qualified for our programs by passing these audits by proving to be registering and doing everything the most authentic and trusted way just because it's good business they get a point of sale system real-time inventory real-time tracking so that when someone makes a contribution whether it's a person or one of our partners we can track in real time who's being impacted how they're being impacted and really have a proof of delivery for all of our promises of social good so that when our clients proudly say we're using social plastic they know that every promise has been delivered just as we said and again everything localizes based on where we are in a country like haiti our locations also act as markets so someone can deposit their value for that plastic and redeem it and withdraw it for food for cooking fuel for the necessities they need and this becomes so important because an average community member might not want to recycle for money however they'll pick up the plastic at their feet and bring it to a plastic bank to get their free cooking fuel their free food because all it costs is the plastic that litters their community in the first place and they start to be involved in that paradigm that plastic has value some of our locations we even look how can we go further close the loop and we have ways that people can bring in not just your plastic but also refillable containers deposit their value refill the refillable containers for soap shampoos hygiene how can we teach these closed loop systems from the root of everything we do and when we look at solving our own last mile solutions in haiti 75 percent of people don't have access to power there's no lighting at night we need solar power to operate our digital platform with wi-fi and accessibility but we also bring it in as a community benefit where this becomes the only source of lighting in the entire community where it also then works to charge their solar power cell phone charging and bring pride into the community where it's not our solution it becomes a community protected solution where everyone's paying a part in not just cleaning the ocean but really cleaning their countries which is something somebody can be proud of once they have that paradigm that they have a part to play. When we look at root cause, we even work at the schools where family members can have their children bring the plastic to the school in a plastic family account, where it pays their tuition, the school supplies. And right from the start of education, we can one, ensure everyone is being educated and included, but two, ensure everyone has that paradigm that there's a responsible way to treat plastic. Now all the plastic collected in our program goes through our processing partners where it's baled, flaked, or pelletized. And then this is where it's sent to our partners to be used as social plastic. You know, and we work with some of the biggest partners in the world. Our companies like Henkel use our social plastic in their product line, but also sponsored our activations into Haiti and Egypt. We have an amazing partner in SE Johnson with their iconic Windex brand using our social plastic and also really funding our expansion into Indonesia and now Egypt or Indonesia and now Brazil. And you know, we continuously look at these companies that are trying to do things in the most authentic way possible to redefine what acceptable plastic looks like. So when we looked at how do we design the system, how do we use technology to help solve this problem, we started with the question that can your recycled plastic supply chain pass an audit back to the point of collection and we knew if we could have that level of trust that level of transparency this is when we could truly change the way responsible plastic is used and create a new standard and this is where it's all done through this blockchain platform it works for our collection members it works for the community members the people running our branches the local stores and partners it gives our clients complete transparency into where their plastic's coming from, how it was collected, and to just verify everything we ever say is the most authentic thing as possible. We also have the ability to do our own certification auditing and just really over verify that everything is a gold standard of authentic trust for an ethical, scalable, 
and traceable system, which really is the way that we can look to be exponential everywhere in the world that we're needed. And you know, it's my personal goal that anyone in the world with a cell phone and a scale could start a plastic bank community and bring change to their locations. And this is where we look at creating more than just a recycling platform, but a purpose platform, where it's a life improvement platform. And you know, COVID has been such an amazing thing for people to experience and it's challenged a lot of businesses. It's challenged a lot of livelihoods. And we've seen in these most vulnerable communities in the world, there's not always government programs to help the most vulnerable. When people are living day by day, you can't wait days for things to arrive. And we've had to learn to be resilient in these times. We've even now started a relief program where our registered collections, where we have a credit score, we have trust, where someone can apply for a relief loan. So instead of taking predatory loans out of desperation, we can trust this bonus payment that someone would be receiving in the future. They can just get an advance on that and repay it and get the care they need, the care their family needs, and really have someone be there and the world be there for them. And this is really what we found when we can unite the world, the consumer, the person you know, in every company, the person buying the products, the person making the products, the person collecting the plastic, using the plastic, all into one you know, interconnected system, we really can unite the world together to regenerate the planet. And you know, I'll just kind of conclude with just, we can look at COVID and the experience that everyone's going through in really two different lenses. And when we watch the news, it's so hard not to obsess with the worst news of the day, the worst thing going on, the worst people not acting right. But I challenge everyone to experience the gift in what we're all going through. I mean, just think, when in human history have we had this shared experience where at 7 p.m., everyone goes outside and celebrates the healthcare workers. They celebrate the first responders. Yes, there are some people not abiding by the rules, but I say on average, humanity for the first time is following the rules. They're working together to create a change and we're actually seeing a positive outcome. And when we compare this to the climate change and the problems that we're having, you know, when everyone's following this new set of principles, the world has started to regenerate itself. We're seeing pollution levels go down. We're seeing catastrophes going away. We're seeing animals where they were not before. And again, it's proof that when we all gather together and we have this shared paradigm that changes need, I think it's really uncovered the fact that change is possible when we're all just united behind the right cause. So please, I welcome you to just experience the gifts, the little things going on, and just see this as a reason to find hope in humanity that I truly do believe that we can solve these problems when we work together. So thank you very much for having me and I hope everyone has a great Earth Day. John, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who joined tonight's event and donated to Plastic Bank. I'm excited to announce that WPC Young Professionals have matched your donations and will be donating $800 to Plastic Bank. And thank you, Sean, for leading these innovative solutions in such a successful organization. Um, we can't wait to see what the future holds with this. I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Todd Myers. I have the privilege of working with Todd and every day is a fun day and he makes the office pretty interesting um, in a good way. Um, so Todd is the director of WPC's Center for Environment with nearly two decades in environmental policy. He is a nationally recognized expert on issues ranging from energy, climate, forestry, and salmon recovery. His writing has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the BBC, National Review, Seattle Times, USA Today, and he has appeared on numerous TV networks, including CNBC, Fox News, and CNN. Todd is a bee farmer with over 100,000 honeybees, and if you're ever lucky to get a jar of his honey, boy, is it good. Todd, take it away. I have to give the bees most of the credit for making the honey, but um, so thank you very much. Um, I want to pick up on something that Sean said uh, first. Um, let me show my 
screen there. Um, one of the things that he said, he talked about the technology, you notice that they have an app um, for people in Haiti and the Philippines and Indonesia. Um, Southeast Asia is where they do a lot of their work. And a recent survey found that 95% of people in Southeast Asia live uh, within range of cell phone coverage. So the amazing thing about technology is that it's become absolutely ubiquitous around the world. And so solutions that weren't possible 10 years ago, we forget that the iPhone has only been around for about 12, 13 years. Things that weren't even possible 10 years ago are now everywhere. And so something like Plastic Bank is a possibility because of that. And it can become a real force for the environment. Um, and so I we'll wanna talk about why we need to change our mindset. Um, today is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And when we first started, the solutions that we came up with were um, to create the EPA, uh, to strengthen the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. And largely those worked. Our air and water are much cleaner today than they were in 1970 because government was very good at targeting large sources of pollution, big smokestacks, big outfalls, and reducing the pollution from them. But today is very different, both in the technology and in the type of problem that we face. And so Bill Ruckelshaus, who was the first director of EPA, um, wrote in Wall Street Journal about 10 years ago saying that yesterday's solutions worked well on yesterday's problems, but the solutions we devised back in the 1970s aren't likely to make much of a dent with the environmental problems that we face today. Pl ocean plastic is a great example because it crosses national boundaries and the place that it is most challenging are places where government structures are not strong enough to prevent trash. We don't have a big problem with trash in the United States because we have very strong collection systems. They don't have that in Haiti, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, in Egypt, in Brazil. That's why they have these trash problems. And so you need solutions that don't rely um, on that 1970s model of government intervention. You need something more innovative that we can do now. And Plastic Bank is a great example of that. But even here in the United States, we have problems with the way that we make environmental decisions. Um, and I'll just give three examples real quickly. First, politicians are not rewarded for environmental success. They're rewarded for being part of cool movements, doing things that appear environmentally friendly, more image than results. Uh, we um, subsidize electric vehicles, we subsidize solar, but electric vehicles and solar are both primarily owned by people who are wealthy. You could pay for them without the subsidies. Um, and if you want to reduce CO2 emissions, you wouldn't put solar panels on somebody's roof. You would support hydro, you would support nuclear, you would support wind, um, which is far less expensive than rooftop solar. But we spend far more money on rooftop solar than we do those other things because it's cool, because people have a sense that it's free, it's from the sun. Um, but when you actually look at where you get the most environmental bang for your buck, um, rooftop solar is the worst, but that's but environment. But politicians are rewarded for coolness, not for results. The second is is that when they make these mistakes, they're not held accountable. Nobody says, "Hey, wait a minute, you did this instead of something that worked better. We're going to vote you out." Voting is complex. There's lots of different elements of it, and knowing what's right and what's wrong is complex. But even when they fail, very clearly, they don't get held accountable. So in 2005, uh, Greg Nichols, who was mayor of Seattle, um, uh, started the uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors Climate Protection Agreement and said that by 2012, Seattle and all these other cities across the country were going to meet the Kyoto Protocol targets for CO2 reductions. Uh, Michael Bloomberg, who was mayor of New York at the time, signed on. Uh, so in Washington state, we had almost 40 cities sign on. And when 2012 rolled around, I called all of those 40 cities and said, how are you doing on your promise to meet the 2012 targets? Two thirds of them said, we have no idea what you're talking about. We don't, we don't even remember what you're talking about because the mayor at the time had signed, but then they'd done nothing. The remaining third had done something, but all of them had missed the targets, including Seattle, where the place had started and New York, where Michael Bloomberg had been mayor. 
but they're not held accountable. Now Michael Bloomberg is out there with a new campaign to meet all new CO2 targets. And nobody ever says to him, why should we trust you when you didn't meet the promises before? So they're not held accountable, which means they don't have an incentive to make sure that the things they do work. Lastly is, is that they simply can't have complete information. Um, even the ones who are sincere, who want to do the best for the environment, who are happy to be held accountable and find the right solutions, don't always know what the right solution is. Um, and that is because there's not one size fits all. And what people know on the ground in their day-to-day -day lives, um, you know, uh, people in agencies, I used to work for a state agency, the State Department of Natural Resources, we could do a lot of things, but there was a lot of things that we could never know because people on the ground were the only ones who had the knowledge. They're the ones who need to have the power, but politicians often have that power and they don't have the information to make good decisions. A great example is I did research on uh, green schools across the country that are built to green building standards. And what I found is, is that the green buildings ended up using more energy than the non-green buildings. And the fact was, is that the people who knew this were the facilities directors at those schools because they knew why they were using more energy, but they had a one size fits all solution imposed on them that didn't work. If you'd put the building managers in charge, they all knew how to make those buildings more efficient, but they didn't get that freedom because the people who were making the decisions didn't have good information. So how do we deal with that? How do we solve those problems that, um, uh, you know, we face in terms of how we make environmental policy. So I'll give you a couple of answers. I'll give you a couple of examples. But the way that we do it is to give people technology and the tools to do more with less and the incentives to do that. And that's why I love this quote from Buckminster Fuller. He says, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, you build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And that's what we're starting to do. So first, you want to engage people so that they have a financial incentive, like with Plastic Bank, to help the environment. Another example are smart thermostats. Because everybody is different, everybody needs to have uh, unique ways to save energy. And what Nest and Ecobee, which is another company that makes smart thermostats, they use artificial intelligence to get used to your preferences. How hot do you like it? When do you like it hot? You know, when are you in the house? When are you out of the house? Um, and those are very personalized solutions and it learns about you over time. Portland General Electric compared people who use smart meters with people who use uh, just um, uh, smart thermostats. And a smart meter gives you information about every 15 minutes, but people didn't really use it. But with a smart thermostat, what they did is they said, okay, from 4 to 7 p.m. is peak demand, which means the prices are the highest. But, in, but uh, homeowners don't tend to pay those prices. Those are paid by the utilities. Um, homeowners tend to have flat rates. Now, the rates go up if people use a lot of energy during those very expensive costs, but they don't really see it. So what Portland General Electric did is they partnered with Nest, and they said, look, if you allow us to turn up or down your thermostat for two by two degrees during these three hours, we'll give you a rebate at the end of the month. And it was completely voluntary. They didn't impose it on anybody. People said, yeah, I, I want to save some money. That's great. I, I'll do that. And what they found was, and what the Nest does is that they say, okay, you're opting in. So before four o'clock, what Nest does is it preconditions your house, either heats it or cools it so you're comfortable so that your house holds that temperature for the next three hours. And what they found was, is that it radically reduced the amount of electricity people were using during peak demand, the most expensive time, by 40% in the first hour, 30% in the second hour, and 20% in the third hour. By the third hour, some people decided to override it and say, no, I'm too cold or too hot, I wanna change it. But imagine being able to reduce electricity use by 30% and get paid for it. That's amazing. But that works with people's individual incentives and technology. Let me give you another example. So uh, if you are a birder, um, you probably know about an app called eBird. It was developed by Cornell University um, so that people could keep track of their checklists, of their life lists, so that when you go birding, 
um, it knows where you are, it knows um, what time it is, um, and then you can say, here are the birds that I saw, and you can keep your whole life list. If you don't know what a bird is, it helps you figure it out. Um, but what happened is, is that Cornell University originally built it on a web page to collect data about where birds were for their database so that they could see migratory patterns and things like that. Once they put it on an app, it absolutely exploded. Um, and the amount of data going into it took off. And now they have millions and millions of uh, pieces of data uh, around the world of where birds are at different type of the year, times of the year. So this, for example, is one of my favorite birds, a cedar waxwing. Um, and it has a good map showing where the birds are at what time of the year. Um, so you can see that in the Northwest, it's not quite time for the cedar waxwing. They'll come in June. Um, but they got this data from people entering it um, and they use it as citizen science. So it supplements the data that scientists have and gives millions more pieces of data than they ever could have collected um, just from scientists. But how they used this was really amazing. So in the Central Valley of California, they wanted to try to create habitat for um, migratory sea, uh, shorebirds. And so what they did is they took all the data they looked at what farms were the areas where the migratory shorebirds were coming in, um, where they needed, um, and what they found was um, that they could actually pinpoint individual farms, rice fields, and they went to those farmers and said, um, how much would we have to pay you to flood your field about this much for the first two or three months of the year? And the farmer said, okay, if you pay me this much, I'll do it to create this habitat. And they called it Airbnb for birds. They called it pop-up wetlands, but it was described as Airbnb for birds. And it was tremendously successful in creating all new habitat that would not have been there if they didn't have the data and didn't provide a financial incentive to the people who had the property. And the great thing is, is that rather than uh, the Nature Conservancy trying to buy the land outright and stop it from uh, people from farming, they were able to lease the land for short periods of time, keep farmers in business, keep those family farms going the rest of the year, um, and, and keep those communities intact, while at the same time increasing the amount of habitat. All of that was done because you had people entering data using technology. Those are the sorts of things that we can do now with technology in ways that government can never do because they never have enough resources. We're seeing that right now with COVID. You never know when the amount of money that you had is suddenly gonna go down, when there's gonna be a recession or something else that happens. And so you need to create systems that are not just environmentally sustainable, but economically sustainable. And that's what technology allows you to do. It is very few times when we can rally an entire nation or entire state or even a community around an environmental um, cause. And even if we could, what works for some doesn't work for others. The beauty of technology is that we can now personalize environmental solutions and give people an incentive to help the environment. So it doesn't matter whether I'm a Republican or a Democrat, a conservative or a progressive. Everybody can find incentives to do what is right and help the environment. We don't have to agree on anything but we can agree that if I help the environment and it helps me um, and creates a business, that is durable and sustainable. Technology can't be voted out at the next election. So it doesn't matter who the president is, Google Nest is gonna continue to save people money. P birders are gonna continue to put data into Airbnb. Plastic Bank is gonna continue to pay people to keep plastic out of the ocean. Those are the resilient, durable sorts of long-term solutions that it's going to take to help the planet. You can't do it four years at a time or from administration to administration. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Miranda, and we'll, we'll go to Benji. All right. Thank you, Todd. And for all of you interested in learning more about Todd's work, check out our website. It's WashingtonPolicy.org. And you can check out his latest blog, Environmental Stewardship, located in your control panel under Handout. All right, so at this time, we are gonna transition into our last speaker of the evening, Benji Backer. 
Benji is the president and founder of the American Conservation Coalition and a senior at the University of Washington. Don't ask me how he manages to be both a student and the leader of a growing national organization. He's just that awesome. He has contributed to publications such as CNBC, The Hill, Fox News, The Washington Examiner, The Independent, and has had a recent feature on CNN. Benji, take it away. Well, thank you, Miranda. Uh, I'm going to get my webcam here. Oh, there we are. Hope everyone's doing well. Happy Earth Day to all. This is actually one of my favorite holidays of the year uh, because I feel like this is something that a lot of times conservatives or market-based people don't necessarily feel like they can engage with because Earth Day is often seen as a left of center holiday and something that only government solutions uh, can be talked about with. And so I wanna tell you about uh, something that we just created called the American Climate Contract. And if you care about markets and you care about the environment, there's finally a voice for you. And that's my organization with the American Climate uh, or American Conservation Coalition. And it's also the plan that we put forward called the American Climate Contract. And I first want to start out by telling you a little bit about ACC. Uh, we are a uh, nonprofit that was founded in 2017, market centric, millennial led, um, and we really have a presence all over the country, 200 college campuses. And it was started in Seattle, Washington, with a lot of amazing folks, including Todd Myers, who is on our board. And really, what we are trying to do is show that market based mechanisms like the ones that Sean and Todd have talked about today are going to be the future of environmental policy and the future of our globe in creating jobs, boosting the economy, and protecting wildlife and the environment at the same time. But what if, in addition to this nonprofit existing, I told you that there was a climate plan that companies could implement, that local governments could implement, that state governments could implement, that the federal government could implement, and that could be spread across the globe? Well, that's the American Climate Contract. And before I get into that, I actually want to tell you a little bit about what we shouldn't do on climate change, and that is socialism. So we hear a lot about that as young people who care about the environment or just are surrounded by, uh, surrounded by school and students and, and teachers all the time. And a great example of why it doesn't work is Venezuela. So Venezuela has control over a ton of industries, but yet the oil market collapsed due to artificially low prices, the society is really struggling, and the national forests are being chopped down because the government has complete control, and that has really hurt uh, water and a lot of other qualities of life. Mm -hmm. So that's one reason. And then the Green New Deal is another reason. Uh, it's a resolution that has no policies behind it. Uh, it tells us that we don't that we can't use gasoline, coal, nuclear, natural gas, hydropower, um, pretty much all of what we use on our energy grid in the United States and abroad. And the cost estimates are as high as ninety six trillion dollars, even if it was implementable. And there are obviously a lot of costs associated with that. So. Um, we wanted to release something that was going to combat that because we care as an organization about climate change and rising emissions and the effects that our pollution has on the environment. So yesterday on Earth Day Eve, which we created um, that term of, I, I think you know now we can call anything an, an Eve, but we called Earth Day Eve. Uh, we wanted to release a climate plan that people could really get behind on both sides of the aisle, which is super important for this issue and that could engage companies all sources or all levels of government and the international scope and that is the american climate contract so what is the american climate contract well it's also attached the full thing is attached if you go to handouts in the right side of the the, the kind of the control panel um, you'll be able to download it but it's our official climate plan. And yesterday it was released with the support of groups like the Young Republican National Federation, the College Republican National Committee, the Students for Trump, but it was also supported by uh, left of center environmental organizations like the Rocky Mountain Institute and uh, the National Wildlife Federation and groups that are center left, but they, they do lean left. And we totally proved that this issue, like 
COVID-19 and plastic banks and other really important uniting issues, this can also be an issue that unites people across political differences. And it's a framework for climate action that is actually tangible, actionable, and something that can get done. So it's already in action, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but it's broken up into four parts, which I'm going to go through today. And you are going to be you know, one of the first groups that is hearing about the American climate contract in its entirety. So energy innovation, 21st century infrastructure, natural solutions, and global engagement. So I want to dive right in, in the sake of time, and talk about energy innovation. So United State, the United States, when it creates energy here, it creates it cleaner than anywhere else in the globe would, especially when it comes to fossil fuels, which is uh, you know, something that is probably hard for a lot of people to hear, but it is the truth. So we need to focus on American-made energy and how to lower emissions on all energy sectors, not trying to pick winners and losers and force ourselves to go to one or two sources of energy, but allow ourselves to lower emissions on all energy sectors today. And so by diversifying your energy portfolio and creating competition when it comes to lowering emissions, you get a lot of fantastic results. It's already happening on its own, thanks to the market and a lot of the tactics that Todd talked about are implementable um, on the market side of energy innovation. When you look at the United States, we have led the world in lowering carbon emissions over the last 12 years without a federal climate policy. That's because of energy innovation and that needs to continue. The second part is 21st century infrastructure. The United States has to invest in infrastructure to prevent from climate change impacts. Uh, we have had a lot of costs on, for, for different natural disasters skyrocket over the past couple of decades, and that will continue as climate change increases. But even more importantly, updating you know, to electric cars and moving towards more fuel efficient cars is something that is really important on the infrastructure side and self-driving cars and different things that will lower traffic. Those are all infrastructural changes that are needed in the United States but that can often be prompted through uh, the market and innovation and technology. And that has some very positive results, obviously in saving money and helping the economy at the same time, all while driving down emissions. The third pillar is natural solutions. So little do people know, nature has its own climate solutions and trees capture carbon and wetlands capture carbon and the ocean captures carbon. And so we need to utilize those and make sure that they're protected and managed properly and make sure that those natural carbon sinks, um, which means that they absorb carbon more than they emit, are a huge part of our uh, transformation forward to a cleaner environment and a cleaner economy. And that's something that is often left out of, of climate change proposals. Another thing that's really easy to implement even in your personal life, you could plant a tree. I mean, it's a really easy solution and natural solutions are really important. The last part is global engagement. Something that people often don't understand is that the, what the United States does is almost irrelevant if the rest of the world does not follow when it comes to climate change. It's a global problem. The air and, our, and water pollution that comes from China and India affects us and what we pollute affects them and every other country uh, across the globe has the same situation. The United States accounts for 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions, which is second most in the world, but it is decreasing at a pretty quick rate. Whereas China and India, China is number one in the world and India is number three, are fastly or are very exponentially gaining in terms of emissions increases. And so in order to reduce emissions, the United States has to engage in the world in the global scale, but also lead the world by expanding technology and economic opportunity to countries like China and India, because China and India will never implement a Green New Deal, but what they will implement is something like the American climate contracts principles that create jobs, boost the economy and help the environment at the exact same time. So what does this look like? Those are pretty bare bones talking points. It's just a framework. You're probably asking yourself, what does that look like? Well, energy innovation in action, deregulating energy markets to allow consumers to choose their energy sources. If uh, you're, you were in Texas 20 years ago, you weren't able to choose where your energy came from. 
Now you are able to do so. And Texas has the second or has the most wind energy out of any state in the country, uh, despite being known as an oil heavy state. That happened because they uh, opened up their energy market to consumer choice. That's one example of energy innovation in action. And it's an example of where consumer choice can drive positive results. It's also expanding nuclear power and hydropower, which is so important for the state of Washington, by scaling back burdensome regulations that are incredibly unnecessary and investing in the, the development of research to protect any damages from happening, but not holding it back and not preventing uh, new action from happening within different energy sectors. Oh. The 21st century infrastructure in action is seawalls and improving our energy grid and also actually building pipelines. Um, it's actually far more uh, energy efficient and better for the environment to build pipelines uh, than it is to transport it via car or rail. Um, and it's also really important to upgrade our energy grid because it's outdated and it's, age it, and it's aging. Um, and then obviously with seawalls, you're able to prevent flooding in, in coastal places like Charleston, South Carolina, or uh, Miami, Florida, and prevent the economic damages that are occurring there all the time and the sea level rise that is creeping in, even in Seattle, we're seeing that. The natural solutions in action is blue carbon is a, is a perfect example. What blue carbon is, is the marine life and, and, and basically everything that is uh, related to oceans and lakes that naturally absorb carbon. So making sure that those areas are protected, um, also managing and restoring forests. Here in Washington state, it's really important to take care of our forests and absorb CO2 uh, through the protection and conservation of the forests and also the management of the forests. One of the major reasons that we have forest fires, uh, it's actually the major reason that we have forest fires in Washington state and in other areas, is because forests aren't managed the way that they used to be. And so we allow them to overgrow. We allow there to be a lot of dead brush. We allow trees to be too close together because we planted them too close together as humans. And then when they have forest fires that are worse than ever before, we have more emissions in the atmosphere than we did to start. And so we actually have to manage our forests better and, and also plant more trees to in different areas of the, of the country to solve this problem. The global engagement side in action is we have to lead by example. One of the, the worst arguments that we can have of not acting on climate change is that we what we do doesn't matter. Well, what we do does matter because the United States has always led the globe in moving in the right direction on key issues. And we need to do the same thing on climate change. We can deploy the technologies that are possible to be implemented by China and India because God knows we, they will not do it themselves. We need to be helping them move in the right direction on our end while we also clean up the environment for our own people here in the United States. Luckily, uh, and as I wrap up, and I would love to you know, hear people's questions and comments, um, this is an implementable strategy. And so if this makes sense and you're like, wow, why isn't this something that people are talking about already? Well, thankfully it is. Uh, on each part of the pillars, except for global engagement, because there's no bills that you can really do in regards to that, uh, there are actually over a dozen, there are a few listed here. And if you're interested, definitely take a screenshot and, and look these up. But there are over a dozen uh, pieces of policy on the federal level and obviously you know, hundreds on the state level and, and in local governments that tackle these exact issues. And really what it boils down to is that these are things that both sides can get behind. These are things that uh, companies can get behind and that are very easily passable because we don't have time to wait for a Green New Deal. We don't have time to wait for a carbon tax. We don't have time to wait for these some of these divisive policies that have split the nation for a very long time. What we can do is start taking steps in the right direction. And these bills that are co-sponsored by Republicans and Democrats do just that. And so we're really excited to see that our climate plan already has policies behind it uh, on the federal level, on the state level, and on the local level. And best of all, what that means is that Georgia can take care of Georgia the way that it needs to. And Washington can take care of Washington the way that it needs to. Because as we know, Georgia and Washington don't have the same problems and the same environmental challenges. And so it's really hard for someone in DC 
to dictate one big climate policy or something to uh, also dictate what happens in those two states and try to equate them in some way. So if you're interested in this, and this makes a lot of sense, and obviously this is just the SparkNotes version, we'd love to have you involved. Um, if you go to climatesolution.eco, all of our resources are there. You can also spread the word on social media um, and also write op-eds. We're happy to help get them placed. We want you involved. And we've got this vast student network across the country that we're engaging people on. We are get, providing people solutions to these issues on. And it's not just climate change. It's ocean pollution. It's protecting our public lands. It's, it's supporting the sportsmen and women that fund conservation. It's all of these things that make our environment turn and protect our environment for future generations. So I'm really thankful that I was invited to talk tonight. I, I, I really love uh, working with Todd and Dan Mead Smith and Miranda on how we can move forward with environmental challenges through a market-based perspective, perspective because that is what it's going to take to, to stop these things, uh, stop these environmental challenges from getting worse. And I'll leave you with this. If you think that Earth Day is a liberal issue or you think that the only solutions are government first solutions, and this was your first time hearing about market-based uh, mechanisms to support the environment, lean in. Take this as a sign that this is an issue to get more involved with because we need you. We need more market advocates. We need more advocates to pr promote environmental stewardship from a common sense approach. What the, the, the government first policy people have been proposing for decades have done is pretty much nothing. What the market has done has been incredible. We need to lean on the market, lean on common sense solutions and get real environmental results. So I'm Benji Backer, president of ACC. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here and hope to see you involved at some point soon. Thank you so much, Benji. And just thank you for your relentless work. And we're excited to see what comes out of this alternative to the not as green New Deal. <laughs> um, we're gonna open it up to Q&A now. So I wanna invite our panelists back. There's Sean and Todd. And um, for, so for the last 45 minutes, we've been getting questions in from our viewers. And my first question is for you, Sean. You know, it sounds good for everyday people to do their part and for the government not to have to be involved. Um, but we get a lot of feedback from environmental groups of that's just not reality, that's an ideal. And in order to make big impact happen, we need government intervention. And when it comes down to it, people are gonna put um, money and income in their pocketbooks in front of protecting the environment. So how would you respond to this? Yeah, no, it's an interesting question. And, you know, especially when we look at it as such a global view where there's so many pieces one, you know, even in some of the countries we operate, even a country like Haiti, government intervention will not be what stops that, that cause of the ocean plastic coming back in. You know, but there's other countries that are really starting to learn that, you know, we do need taxation on new plastics. We do need to start enforcing things when they can come in. We've always taken the approach of what can we act on now that's in our control, you know, while really trying to gather the right people. You know, I, I've been incredibly inspired too that when we work with companies, you know, it's not companies making these changes, it's one empowered purpose champion who says, I can make this happen. And, you know, I think the same things come with governments and lobbying where over time, you know, we're just getting these new norms where purpose-based decisions are starting to just become acceptable, you know, in corporations, acceptable in consumerism. And I am optimistic that it can be acceptable in governments as well. And each just play their part, but when they all come in together is really when we get complete solutions, which, you know, I'm optimistic about. You know, I wanna, I wanna add a, a great story along those same lines, which is dolphin safe tuna. For a long time, people would catch tuna with nets that also caught a lot of dolphins. And the way that that changed, the way that the tuna companies changed to nets that didn't have impact on dolphins was, that one of the advocates went and met with one of the heads of the tuna companies and said, showed a video and said, look, this is what's happening. And they decided that it was good business to put the dolphin safe tuna um, symbol on their tuna can. 
And then every other tuna company had to follow suit, right? They weren't going to be the ones that didn't have dolphin safe tuna. So it was the companies, Sean's example I think is great because it was the companies in the case of dolphin safe tuna that led and then government said, okay, now we can help enforce this. But it was the opportunity of individual people, individual companies to be the leaders and make that first change. And one thing I want to add too is that I think we all understand the negative externalities that come from the tragedy of the commons on the environment with some, it's something that we all use and we all extract resources. And that's something that is one of the rare instances where I believe a limited government system should be able to step in. But I think what we're all advocating for here is kind of for the, the reliance on the government to be turned on its head in terms of when you're looking for a solution, instead of saying, what can the federal government do first, say, can a company handle this first? And then if, if that's not possible, then say, can a local government handle this? And if that's not possible, then can a state government handle this? And if that's not possible, then go to the federal government. Don't just automatically assume that the federal government's going to have the answers because they often don't, and they often don't have the capacity or the unity to do it. So I think what we're all saying here is that we have to rely on the market and we have to also just kind of flip the script in terms of don't always just think that the federal government is going to solve these challenges first. It doesn't mean that the federal government has no role, that the government has no role at all. It just means that we have to realign our priorities. Okay, so next question. The executive director of the Climate Advocacy Group 350.org, which I'm sure you've all heard of, and Maybov, she said, was quoted in a recent environmental um, piece. We've seen that the governments can act and people can change their behavior in a very short amount of time. A growing number of cities and countries have formally declared a climate emergency. What would happen if the world reacted to climate change like it's reacting to the coronavirus? This is a free for all. Yeah. Well, it's not. We've had a chance. We've been working on this for more than 20 years. So I mentioned the U.S. Conference of Mayors Climate Protection Agreement in 2005 um, in terms of Kyoto. So the Kyoto set targets for 2012 for a number of different countries. Um, most of those countries failed to meet those targets, even with um, the Great Recession. So the Great Recession, like now, we saw a big downturn in CO2 emissions. The, when the economy recovered, they went back up a little bit. So most of those countries missed those targets. Now we have the Paris Climate Accords, um, but most countries that are signed on to the Paris Climate Accords are not even meeting their own promises. Here in Washington State, uh, Governor Inslee says that you know he cares about climate change, um, and yet we have continually failed to have climate policy. The voters have rejected uh, carbon taxes twice. So the question is, what do you do in the, in the face of all that failure? Um, do you just keep beating your head against a wall and hoping that this time will convince them? Um, I think what we need to do is to say, all right, let's find a way like that Buckminster Fuller, rather than fighting the existing reality, create a new reality that people wanna go to. Have people save energy and save money with um, th uh, smart thermostats. I just wrote a piece about uh, Great Britain. In Great Britain, there is a utility called Octopus. And what Octopus does is it charges very high rates during peak demand. Peak demand is not only when electricity is most expensive generally, but it's generally when they have to flip on natural gas and coal plants, so it's also the most polluting. By charging those rates, they shift demand before and after that period of time. Before is when there's solar during the day, and after is when there's wind. And in fact, sometimes there's so much wind, they actually charge negative rates. People only thought that happened with oil. No, it happens with wind. And so what happens is when there's a lot of wind on the system, they actually pay people to take it. So if you have an electric vehicle, you can charge it. Those are the sorts of things, like I said, it doesn't matter who's in charge. It doesn't matter who's prime minister. It doesn't matter who's president. Um, those things are gonna make sense. They are gonna be durable over the long term. So hoping that we can all rally together like we're dealing with now um, is really gonna be hard in any other circumstance. So you have to look for every opportunity. Yeah, I'll just jump in and out on that where, you know, I, I think the one, again, blessing that COVID's almost revealed is that the world actually is capable of rallying around something. 
And that is something people may have questioned is, could we do with unity? Now, you know, I love there's that quote of whether you think it's possible or impossible, you're right. And if we just at least have been able to witness when humanity steps back, you know, our damage can be reduced. And if people can at least trigger this to the point that change is possible, you know, I'm such a big believer in responsible consumerism where the such the power is, if people stop buying a product, it goes out of business. If people stop buying from a company, they go out of business. And when you realize that everything you buy is a vote for how a product was made and the company who made it, and we can really start attaching this responsibility with my choice and transparency to if I'm supporting a positive climate, if I'm supporting this, I can use the most powerful thing I have in my vote and only support the players that are making a positive impact. And we're now living in a world where things are more transparent. It's harder to do evil and get away. And this is something to me, if we can piggyback on COVID that change is possible and realize everyone has the power to change with how they spend their money, this is where the really the people can be one of the most powerful forces in what is economically just good business. And it could just be good business to exist to do good, otherwise you cease to exist. And this just becomes common sense. And I, and I think just one final thing to add on there is that you can't devalue the importance of consumerism in this process. The environmental movement often, again, as I was alluding to earlier, off, often just talks about federal government or bust or international or bust. And it's, it's similar to, to saying that your voting doesn't matter because you're just one vote. It's like your, your, your consumerism matters, even, even as you were just one person because you're setting a culture and you're setting a trend and, and your consumer dollar matters so much more to these companies than anything else to them. I mean, you are, you are keeping them alive. And, and so we have to also realign our priorities and understand how much power we have as individuals, not just politically, but as consumers. And so shopping sustainably and buying Nest thermostats or using plastic bank or, you know, doing those amazing consumer activities can flip this problem on its, on its head. And while COVID has shown us that, you know, we have a huge impact on the environment, what it's also shown us is that a shutdown of our economy and a shutdown of our livelihoods just to save the environment won't work because people are struggling. People are really struggling right now. And so we have to work with people and work with companies and figure this problem out together and not just shut down our lives as people have been trying to advocate for it because it's happened because of a different reason and that is not going to be sustainable in the long term. Yeah, and you said that, you know, companies want to make decisions that consumers are, are going to say, oh, I like that. I'm going to go, I'm going to go buy from that store now. And especially with the millennial and upcoming generations, we want to support organizations that agree with our environmental uh, mindsets. And one organization I think of is Costco. I mean, Costco, they have a win-win situation going on where they don't, no one had to ban plastic bags from Costco. They did it on their own. And they, you know, you take out, you use the boxes they have, and they're saving money because they don't have to provide you with anything. And they're recycling their boxes and you're still going home without an increased tax or paying extra for plastic or for paper bags. So I think Costco is, among other things, has done a great job of doing that. And everyone loves Costco. <laughs> um, so the next question is from Mark. This is for Todd. Municipalities over the last few years have been banning plastic bags. And now with COVID-19, we are seeing a return to paper or allowing plastic bags. What are your thoughts? So one of the things I think about the plastic bag ban is, is that you always have to remember there are trade-offs. So if you um, are concerned, if, if right now healthcare is everybody's biggest concern um, and so being safe. And so reusable bags are not the option that people trust, right? In some places, some stores that simply said, we don't want your reusable bags. Um, we would prefer that you use disposable bags. At other times, that's not gonna be the case. But in every decision that we make for the environment, we have to recognize uh, that there are trade-offs. So um, you may like, you want to ban plastic bags, but if you go to a cotton reusable bag, a cotton reusable bag is very energy intensive. You have to put fertilizer to grow the cotton. That fertilizer, some of that runs off. 
creates what's called eutrophication, which takes the oxygen out of the water. There is uh, what's called a dead zone at the mouth of the Mississippi River because of fertilizer, not just from cotton, but from a variety of things. So these things are very complicated. And I, and I tell people who figure out what can I do? What, what helps the environment? Should I choose this or should I choose this? And I just say, one, there are trade-offs. Um, if you, uh, you know, buying an electric car is great if you're concerned about um, climate change. If you're more concerned about mining and some of the impact of how we get that, then that's a different concern. But there is no particular right answer. Both there are trade-offs. And I think that's one of the big lessons of the plastic bag ban is, is that we're now seeing is, is that there was a trade-off that we didn't fully appreciate until we faced a healthcare crisis. But the second thing is people are going to make the wrong decision. These things are very complicated. Um, what you think is true today, may, you may find out is wrong tomorrow. Don't feel guilty about that. Just say, all right, I get it, I'll change. I think one of the things that I've seen in working in politics for 20 years, politics don't like to admit that they're, politicians don't like to admit that they're wrong. And so when they make the wrong decision, they tend to be stubborn. We shouldn't do that. We should be flexible. We should be willing to learn, get new information and change the consumer behavior that we have, uh, like Sean said, based on that new information because it's gonna change. Okay, so next question is for Benji. And um, this is a college student. What if universe from Josiah, what if universities competed to find and implement climate change solutions as outlined in your contract? How could we best do that? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I actually think that that's one of the, that sort of approach is something that we should be trying to look at, not just for universities, but for companies. Like how fun would it be if the world's largest companies were competing on, on how much they've reduced emissions and you knew when you went to a grocery store or you went to buy a piece of technology or you went to buy a car, which companies were being the most environmentally sustainable. I know that would dictate part of my decision, obviously price to some degree, but if they were pretty comparable, I would want to choose the sustainable option. I think that'd be super cool. And then if you're trying to do it on the university level, that would be amazing as well. One of the things that I think you bring up with this amazing question is how we can encourage universities to do more because universities have the capabilities to do it. And especially a university like I go to, the University of Washington, they have the, the endowments and, and the financial resources to do it. And so as a student, you have a huge stake in that, way more than you even have as a consumer or as a voter, because you are one of, at the very most, 40,000 people that goes to that school. And so we need to be using our student voices to leverage smart environmental decisions. And if there could be some sort of national or uh, maybe even regional competition about uh, emissions reductions, I think that'd be incredible for universities. I don't know how that would start. You'd probably need to have some, some national grassroots organization uh, like the Nature Conservancy or, or something like that that had the capacity to do that, uh, to step in and, and ask for that. But even without engaging other universities, you can definitely try to engage your own in sustainable practices like that. I also would love to hear what Todd thinks about kind of what universities could could do today um, that would be really helpful and how students could have a role in that as well. Yeah, I think that, I think what we've all said is, is that, um, I think the mindset needs to be that individual action adds up to big changes. Um, and I think too often the message that we get out of universities is that it is somebody else's responsibility. Either it is the university administration's responsibility or it is the government's responsibility. The beauty about technology today is, is that we all now have the power, I mean, literally in the palm of our hands, um, to make meaningful changes. Um, and I think um, that single message that said, rather than outsourcing your environmental concern to somebody else, take that power and do it, and it will make a real difference. Um, that's, an, that's an empowering message that is connecting you to results and, and effectiveness. That's a message I would like to see coming out of universities. University of Washington has a web page where it says, here's how much CO2 we reduced, all these sorts of things. That's great. But it is detached from the people who are making 
you know, the day-to-day -day decisions. We need to um, connect people to those decisions um, in a way that I don't think we do now. Okay, next question is for Sean. Could the plastic bank model be replicated in the U.S., or does it only work in developing countries with high amounts of plastic waste? Yeah, I mean, one thing that we found, even in the different countries we work in right now, you know, our Haiti model is not the Philippines model. It's not the Brazil model. So, you know, every single country almost needs a unique, slight twist on everything we do. So the, the economics on, you know, how much you get for recycling and what it means to a livelihood in most developing countries just isn't close to what it is in the more developed countries. So we'll continue to look at a more model where it can be adapted, but even what we do is we offer programs where schools and places of faith can be involved in awareness, recycling. And, you know, I think one thing, and I'm, I'm from Vancouver, Canada, and one thing I think is very similar in the United States as well, if we got to the point that just home segregation, office segregation was just where the plastic never got mixed and always got to the right place, I think there truly is a closed loop way that everybody could just handle plastic responsibly and really have the knowledge that if I'm going to choose to buy something made of plastic, I'm gonna make sure I'm responsible with it. And there's a lot of catching up on these systems, but I think it's fully possible that we just close the loop where no one would dare put something in the wrong bin because it's just easy to do. We got a long way to go to get there. You know, other than our school and faith programs, we will be looking at more in the United States, but I'm just a big believer that with awareness is really going to come that paradigm of change. We have a lot of good questions coming in. This one's from Eli to all panelists. As far as consumerism goes, what about greenwashing? There are a lot of companies who claim to be eco-friendly to fool consumers. How can we make sure that companies are held responsible? Sean, talk about uh, blockchain. Yeah, I mean, so one thing we, you know, from the get-go, like even when we started, we needed to almost be so obsessively like audit-proof, bulletproof, everything just to get over, you know, the smell of greenwash, which so many companies have done in the past. So one, just taking anything for granted of someone saying, trust me, our label says we're doing good is one where, you know, we really need the educated consumer to be looking for what is the gold standard of doing it right. I mean, yeah, for us, we use blockchain so that we can verify everything. We can literally prove every single person the second they got the impact promise delivered. And, you know, but the biggest thing I've found is, you know, a lot of our clients actually come to us because their staff wants to bring in something authentic. I actually think it's a lot easier to trick a consumer than it is to trick the staff who works for a company. I think internally people knows when something doesn't smell great. And this is becoming something that some companies are realizing that, you know, that authenticity, you know, one, you'll lose consumers when you're inauthentic, inauthentic, but two, you know, your staff quits when they realize you're doing something inauthentic. And that's starting to become a best practice to attract and retain talented people. So I think even more than the consumer level, we're starting to get the average person doesn't want to be part of greenwashing in the marketing team, greenwashing internally. And that's starting to drive a new change of just pure authenticity as the best business practice, or else there's too much risk. So let me just add a little bit about what blockchain, for those of you who don't know, blockchain is just, it's an online ledger. Um, so if you've heard of Bitcoin, Bitcoin is a blockchain. So it is totally transparent so that anybody can see all of the transactions. So it's very difficult to hide something that has gone on, which makes it, very good for auditing so that you can know that what you're getting is what is promised. So we've started to do this. Can, can we do that? The, can we do blockchain for the government? So we can. It's actually interesting. So there, um, there are efforts now to do blockchain with government expenditures and transactions. It's often a little bit of overkill for government, but um, for difficult for um, ledgers that you're worried about, where you want that proof, like Sean is talking about, it works really nicely. And so uh, there is actually a movement among um, some organic farmers where they want to say, look, here we can show you what happened at every step of the way, because one of the challenges with, if you have, if you grow a free range chicken, 
you want to know that it went to the processing plant and that the processing plant didn't swap out a chicken that wasn't free range or something else. And so you can follow that every step of the way. Um, and there's a company called Green Acres Farms in the Midwest that does this and you can actually get online and look, here's the, here is my chicken that went from here to here to here. In China, they are developing a situation where they actually put a little um, tag on the chicken and it tracks how much the chicken walked, the air the chicken breathed, what was the food it ate, and put all of these sorts of things so that you know uh, right down to those details. And it's all on the blockchain, so it's auditable and you can see what it's there. So that's how you can start to deal with greenwashing um, uh, um, by companies. But there's also government greenwashing. And I don't want to forget that government greenwashes as well. I mentioned the problems I had with um, green buildings. So a lot of the green buildings in Washington State green schools use more energy than their non-green counterparts. And so I would go to uh, the facilities directors. And I remember I did this in Nevada and I looked at their green schools and I got an email from one of the facilities directors and said, I saw your report about our green schools not performing. And I expected this guy to be very upset with me because I was criticizing his building. He says, thank you for saying this. I have been trying to explain to the school board that these buildings don't perform better, but they wanted the plaque. They wanted a plaque on the wall that said it was green. That's just as bad greenwashing as any business does. So greenwashing is, is everywhere. We have to be careful of it transparent auditing can help with that and technology is a great way to do it yeah and one thing i also think for for the just the traditional consumer it's making sure that these companies are following through and the other thing that is very obvious is that there are a lot of companies pledging to go 100 percent renewable or 100 percent clean or you know whatever that might look like and if they are planning on doing that that is awesome but the thing that we have to do as consumers is follow up you know, look at look at their reports. Are they actually moving towards that, or are they just claiming that? And like, it's basically the same thing as putting a plaque on their wall as it is getting a positive news story about being 100% clean by X date. You can say you're going to be 100% clean by 2050. That's 32 years from or 30 years from now. I just thought it was 2018. That is bad. Um, but 30 years from now, and uh, you know. They, 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 they're they just assuming that you're going to forget or that things are going to be different by then. And so follow through, you know, look at, do they have sustainability reports? Are they reporting on if they are, you know, moving towards the right directions? You can try to check in. It's not with every company, but you can try to check in and follow up on most companies' promises and see if they're being kept. And that's our role as consumers. And I know that takes a couple extra moments, but it's totally worth it in the long run. And I think the last thing is that similar to what Todd said earlier, you're not always going to make the right decisions. So if someone's greenwashing and they, you know, they tricked you into thinking they were environmentally sustainable and you find out that they weren't like, you, you can't feel bad about that. It's the same, it's the same sort of thing where, you know, there's, there's only so much that a consumer or a voter can take in and we can do what we can do best. And that is do our best to make the right decisions. And, you know, seven out of 10 times or eight out of 10 times or more, we are going to make the right decisions and having that mindset is worth it in the end. Well, thank you all for sending your questions. And I know there's several we didn't get to, so I'm actually gonna reply to you and answer your questions um, post event. We need to get moving so we end on time. So just stay tuned from an email from me and we will answer your questions. We appreciate you coming to this event and trying to be an environmental steward. So we will get to those later. Um, before we conclude our evening and before I announce our winner of the Ocean Plastic Hero Certificate, I have a special guest speaker, Chris Gargel, Washington Policy Center's Eastern Washington Director, who has an exciting project to share with you. Um, our panelists just left, Benji, Todd, and Sean, thank you so much for being leaders in this area and taking time tonight to show us all how technology and different market solutions can harness in innovative solutions to our environment. Chris, take it away. Well, good evening, uh, Miranda. Thanks very much. Uh, I hope everyone is in uh, good health and good spirits as we uh, deal with the current coronavirus uh, situation. I want to uh, switch gears a little bit uh, to talk a little bit about 
uh, a real problem that we have uh, in the country outside of the coronavirus situation, of course, in our healthcare uh, situation. And that is that the youngest generations uh, are warming to the idea of socialism and are deeply skeptical of our free market uh, enterprise system. Uh, they see it, as many of you probably are aware, as corrupt and very destructive. And they hear nothing but complaints about income inequality, about climate change, environmental degra uh, degradation, uh, and they lay all of the problems uh, for this, uh, in many cases, at the feet of capitalism. They say this is why we need uh, democratic socialism. Perhaps you've heard that argument before, or uh, Bernie Sanders, whatever that might uh, uh, mean uh, to you. So they, they want to change the system. Uh, they want to reform our society uh, into many different uh, things. Many different arguments are made in that direction. They want to see our society uh, change, and they see our society right now as a capitalistic society. And so we have to understand that basic temperament, and we have tried to understand that basic temperament at Washington Policy Center. So earlier this year, at the end of last year, as part of our three-year strategic planning process at WPC, we launched a project called Free Markets Create. Uh, and we're teaming up with a creative studio in Austin, Texas called Emergent Order. And the goal is to bring a fresh, bold, and never before seen perspective and approach to reaching millennials and Generation Z and folks uh, 18 to 34, the youngest of our fellow Americans, in order to convince them uh, that the marketplace uh, will be the best uh, direction for our uh, country and the future of America. And so what we're doing tonight is we're announcing uh, that particular campaign called Free Markets Create and what that campaign will look like. Will look like. And as I mentioned before, as Americans and as uh, folks 18 to 34 uh, know quite well, they are temperamentally progressive and they want to destroy things uh, and replace them with things that are even better. And so what we're announcing tonight is a bold campaign to do exactly what they want to do, destroy things that they hate and improve their lives for the better. And so I'm going to share my screen here to show a little bit more uh, about what this campaign uh, will look like, if you give me one moment. Should pop up here in just a second. So free markets uh, destroy traffic jams. They destroy hunger and poverty. They destroy boredom. Markets improve everything. Uh, everything that you uh, can think of, markets improve. Free markets have taken things like Blockbuster and created uh, Netflix. They destroy old products. They create innovators. And free markets improve everything uh, in our lives. And we are going to take that message to young Washingtonians and perhaps the, re the entire region and really the entire country this summer and this fall. You've seen uh, some of these images that Emergent Order is underway with uh, in the design and creative testing phase. Uh, we plan to launch it across Facebook, across, across Instagram and uh, other online platforms very, very soon. This project is one of the biggest things that WPC uh, really has ever done, and it is separate and on top of our annual $4 million budget. So you can find out more about the Free Markets Create campaign uh, on our website at WashingtonPolicy.org. Um, WashingtonPolicy.org, we have much more information there, and you can also find out a little bit more about it on our YouTube channel under Markets Improve Everything. So we hope you'll join us with this campaign. You'll be seeing a lot more about it in the coming months as we try to impress upon 18 to 34 year olds, especially our young professionals group, the importance of the free marketplace in not only Washington State, but across the entire country. I know many of you have attended our annual dinner events in the past. Uh, we are tonight making a special announcement of our annual dinner speakers. Um, many of you have probably seen Dr. Charles Krauthammer, perhaps UN Ambassador Nikki Haley, Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, many more. Tonight we're pleased to announce our speakers for both Western and Eastern Washington, the annual dinner events. Our Western Washington annual dinner will be held on Friday, September 25th at the Bellevue Hyatt and will feature former South Carolina Congressman and U.S. Attorney Trey Gowdy, 
I have to tell you, Trey Gowdy is one of the most inspirational speakers I have ever heard. Uh, you'll want to be there on the 25th for this event. We'll announce a second speaker for the Bellevue Dinner very, very soon. And then just three weeks later, on October 16th at the Davenport Grand Hotel, our Eastern Washington annual dinner with former Texas Governor and U.S. Secretary of Energy Rick Perry, as well as po political analyst and author Candace Owens. Uh, we should note that during Governor Perry's time at the state capitol in Austin, Texas accounted for 30 percent, 30 percent of the nation's job growth. And Candace Owens, by the way, is so popular uh, that she's attracted more than two million followers on her social media pages uh, throughout the country. So again, our annual dinner events on uh, September 25th uh, at the Bellevue Hyatt on October 16th at the Davenport Grand Hotel. Get your tickets right now, washingtonpolicy.org. Uh, it's gonna be a terrific, terrific event. Uh, we hope everyone will be able to join us at those two events coming up this fall when we hope things will be back to normal. We'll send it back to you, Miranda. All right, so now it's time to announce our winner, Anna Sosnowski. I hope I didn't butcher your last name, Anna Sosnowski. We will be following up um, with an email to you. So you are winning the Ocean Plastic Hero Certificate, which is a one-year subscription um, to Plastic Bank. And, and this recovers 168 kilograms of ocean-bound plastic, or double the amount of plastic that you will use in one year. So stay tuned. I want to give a shout out to all of you who attended tonight's event and donated to Plastic Bank. I think all of us have made a positive impact um, tonight for taking the time to hear such great opportunities for environmental improvement that each of us can make happen individually. If you enjoyed tonight's event and are between 18 to 40 years of age, we hope you'll join our YP community. You can visit us at washingtonpolicy.org slash professionals or click the link in the chat box. Our next event is May 28th featuring filmmaker Chris Rufo on his recent documentary America Lost and this will also be a virtual event. It's going to talk about how do we rebuild America's families and communities from the bottom up. You can register at our website or click the link in the chat box. And then I also want to invite you to WPC's weekly virtual solution series event. Open to all ages and free to attend. Join us next Wednesday, the 29th, or when your schedule allows. I hope you walk away from tonight's event with a better understanding of the power of the free market solutions. Rather than relying on the government to mandate behavior, I hope you will advocate for policies that give more control to everyday people like you and me and actually help the environment without hurting the economy. I hope this event encouraged you to try something new. Thank you for joining us. Have a great rest of your evening. To end tonight's event, we're gonna play a two minute video on what YPs are all about. We hope to see you again next time in person. Thank you. Young Professionals is for anyone 18 to 40 years of age and we're statewide. We have groups in Seattle, Tri-Cities, and in Spokane. We also have college clubs statewide at University of Washington, Seattle University, University of Puget Sound, Washington State University, and Gonzaga. We have events all year long. We usually start of the year by going to Olympia to meet state legislators. For the rest of the year, we have quarterly events, including happy hours in Eastern and Western Washington. In the summer, we definitely take advantage of the weather by going on an environmental hike, as well as hosting casual summer socials. Washington Policy Center's research is important because it keeps Washington income tax free, business friendly, and a place where people want to live and work. 
The YP Annual Dinner is our biggest event of the year. It's an evening of networking, socializing, receptions, and hearing from some of the country's most influential speakers. Washington Policy Center Young Professionals is a voice for sanity in public policy here in Washington State. Washington Policy Center provides meaningful and, and actionable information for both the citizens who are our voters and the policymakers themselves. In 2018, we held our Charter School Volunteer Event. And in 2019, we added a scholarship program for graduating seniors. So people oftentimes come up to me and ask, how do I join the Washington Policy Center Young Professionals? So you've got two options. You can join through the website, or you can come up and find an existing member, find a board member, develop a relationship. Young Professionals is for anyone. If you're passionate about the free market and making a positive impact in Washington State, join us.